Okay, we'll start our uh, meeting today. We have a very pleasant guest, Ben Perica. Today we're going to talk about his uh, molecular motors. He is a very special guest to us. He's won several prizes already, but of course also the Nobel Prize, and we're going to interview him about it. And actually, well, we wondered, why did you even choose chemistry in the beginning? Why did I choose chemistry? That's a very good question. Uh, when I was in high school, my, uh, I, had, I had excellent teachers, I must say, but in particularly uh, my chemistry and physics teacher. My best marks actually were in mathematics. Yeah? But my chemistry teacher, me and Ben, you need to talk. Yeah? You see here my chemistry teacher, Meneer Opdeweeg? And he was such an inspiring teacher that he. Uh, he did experiments with us, making nice crystals, uh, smelling compounds, uh, all these kind of crazy things, you know, that you can do in the chemistry laboratories. And, I, and, and even sometimes we stayed after the normal lessons in the afternoon to uh, help him a little bit, you know, not only cleaning up glassware, uh, but, but also doing some experiments. And it was really a very inspiring person. And that actually made me decide, I was typically a beta kid, eh? You know, uh, math, uh, chemistry, physics, uh, mathematics, and so on. But that made me to decide to go into chemistry because I like to, to see that something that you could really see and feel. And this was really nice. So, would you say you were an uh, outstanding student in chemistry? Or, uh... Uh, my, 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 I was a, a reasonably good student, I would say. You know, my, my, as I mentioned before, my highest marks were, were in mathematics. Yeah. Uh, is it? Do you need to be a really good student to, to win a Nobel Prize in chemistry? Uh, I don't know. What is a good student, you know? You can, you can study and, and get nines on your exams, but that doesn't mean that you are a good researcher or that you are creative or that, that you have ideas. I, uh, I think, yes, you should at least have some good marks in the sense that if you have only six minus or five plus, uh, you hardly barely make it. It is difficult, you know, to work in chemistry or physics or whatever uh, because you understand half of the, 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 the formulas and the theory and the reactions, etc. Uh, you don't understand that. So at least you should have a certain a solid basis. But you don't have to be... I had students that got only nines, nine pluses on their exams, but when they went into the laboratory, they had very much difficulties with doing experiments, etc. So sometimes I hire people for a PhD that have, uh, say, nominal sevens or so on their, uh, on their normal courses. But they are outstanding yeah, with respect to experimental skills. They understand chemical reactivity. They, are, they have a feeling for new materials or, or doing a typical, uh, do a good measurement. You have to work with, with a good a piece of equipment in the lab and to do a very accurate measurement. That, that needs other skills than just reproducing what you have seen in the books. So it's a combination. Yes. Yeah, so, so what would you say is it you have that, that others don't have because of which you want to Now, so yeah, you that's it. difficult to say. I always, when I was a student, and Hank knows that, we were competing with each other sometimes for exams. We always wanted to know everything. So I, I had this, when I was a kid already, you know, when I grew up on the farm, I wanted to know how is it possible that from this tiny seed, a big eh, sunflower grows? How is it possible that, that nature, that, that plants are green? Yeah? How is it that water flows down? Um, when I studied chemistry, I wanted to learn not only what the teacher or the professor told us, but also what was in the sidebar in the book. And I wanted to understand the exercises and so it gave me a certain proud to understand and to know what was going on. Uh, if I couldn't solve a, uh, a, a question in the book, I felt very frustrated. And I remember we had discussions about it. How could it be that, it, uh, that we cannot solve it? And then we went to the professor and asked. But I was not, <coughs> excuse me, I cannot deny that I had good marks. But when I really got excited about chemistry, it was not in the first two years. I got really excited in my third year, and you see here on the slide my professor Hans Winberg, and he was American. And Hank and I, and Gibson and myself, we studied with Hans Winberg, and he challenged us a lot. 
I remember he gave me a project saying, we will make our American friends jealous. It was an impossible project. I never made it, you know. During my PhD, I partly succeeded several years later. This was my first molecule I made in my third year, that apparently it was a modified vinyl. It's not important. This molecule, I was so proud because when I came to Winberg, the professor, he said, Ben, nobody has made this molecule in the world before. And I was so proud. Can you imagine? Nobody had made this molecule. It was absolutely useless, totally useless, but I made it. And that set me off. That gave me the real game. So he, he like, mentioned that you were feeling very passionate about it, about chemistry, so we know now why you're yeah. into it. But we actually also wondered, how does a normal day of your life after winning the Nobel Prize look like? <laughs> Is it? Yeah, a normal day. There are no normal days, maybe. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I still I teach, although I don't teach first year classes, now I teach master classes at the moment. And I still have a sizable research group, so we do a lot of different projects, so I enjoy that a lot. But of course, I get so many invitations, and not only for chemistries around the world, to go to conferences and all. So last week, I came back this weekend from Spain to a catalysis conference, a little bit different than I talked about today. But uh, I promised myself when I was in Stockholm, what can I do for our society, for the university, for the school? And so I said, look, if I get invitations to talk to students, to, to high school, elementary school, to teachers, so this is what I give priority. I have to say no a lot. But uh, once a month, once every six weeks, I go to a school or so, or I talk to students or to the general public to advocate why education, why science is so important. And uh, if I can help them in this way, I, I think that's okay. I get a lot of invitations, eh? a lot from business clubs, from medical people, from opening musea. Most of them, I can say, sorry, I have no time. So, so uh, you actually left academics for six years to go to Shell. Yeah. Uh, why, did you, why did you leave the academics? Yeah, that is uh, very nice. You see here, Shell. I went to, uh, after my PhD, the, re the real reason is I wanted to go to America to do a postdoc, like many people here. And my professor was an American, and he had arranged already something, you know, to go to the post office. But then I had to go in the army, because in the 80s, the army, becoming a soldier, was still compulsory, eh? And I was not very keen on going into the army after my PSD. You know, you are 25 and going into the army and partying all the time. So Shell kept me out of the army. And they offered me a job here at Taas Lab, at that Shell Research here in Amsterdam, you know, behind the central station. And I went there for five years, and I also went a year to England. And this was an absolutely fantastic period, because you have to realize, at that time, these research companies, they had built big central research. And it was fantastic. Piet van Leeuwen, well known here in Amsterdam, he was a professor here at this chemistry department. He was my boss. And several professors worked at Shell Laboratories. And it was, at that time, the catalysis university of the world. And it was for me fantastic. Going out of the comfort zone, working in a big multinational, it was absolutely fantastic. I had a great, great time then. Well, why did you decide to go back yeah, to Yeah, that's a good question. I had expected that. The, the, after six years, I was still reading the Jacks, Angewandte, and Nature. And I thought, then this is not good. I was not so interested in this business and in the oil refineries or in Venice or the Botlet or go to the companies. I was more interested in the later scientific discoveries. So I thought maybe my future is working with students, teach, and, and build my own research programs. And this is what I enjoyed so much. And I, I don't regret any moment that I went back to university. So, so uh, you've said uh, in various interviews before that uh, universities should be more like playgrounds. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you mean that? Yeah, university should be a playground. I think it is really important that we at the universities, as a community of scholars, academics, students, young and senior talents, everybody together, that we have sufficient space yeah, to look beyond our horizon. And I cannot emphasize this enough. Don't misunderstand me. I'm a chemist. I have worked my whole career, also in academia, 
also with companies. We always have some projects where we do something which is industrial relevant. We even had some processes that we developed with my students that were implemented in a company, for instance, to make a new drug. But the basis of university is education. And we, and several politicians don't grab that. We should not educate our students for today. We should educate them for tomorrow, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, because the young people here are going to shape, you are going to shape our society, our industry, our organization. In 10 years, 20 years from now, we should not educate them for today or tomorrow. Then we are going to do the right thing. So we look in our education, in our research, we should look far beyond our current horizon, what will be important in the future? What is your training? What is needed? In and that is where we need also this playground, the playground to invent, to discover, to make mistakes, because you learn from your mistakes. Would you say, because we had another guest a few months ago, Robert Nekha, yeah. he said it was um, in his university in Princeton, the um, uh, scientists, like, they walk around, they think that afternoon, and they are not, like, obligated to, to produce, maybe? Would you say that's a, a form? Now, yeah, that is, uh, you have to, I, Robert Dijkhoff is a great friend of mine, and he is a fantastic, of course you should realize, he is in this Institute for Advanced Science. There they don't have to teach, there they uh, can discuss about problems in theoretical physics and mathematics, etc. and what is in between the stars, this is fantastic. It's absolutely a dream job, a job that he has. But you should also realize, we teach our students, eh? Jan van Maasveen, he teaches, Hank teaches, we, we are also, we do practical courses. We do research with our PhD students at master's school and post um, I, I think he is right in the sense that we should have more time to think and to discuss. A lot of the things we do, we do with our colleagues together, multidisciplinary research. At the academic community, what we lost a little bit is we have not a lot of time to have academic discussions. Like we simply sit here now, yeah, and we can discuss maybe. We should do that more often with our colleagues from biology, from humanities, talk about ethical problems. Yeah? Do we want to have nanotechnology? Do we want to have genetic modification? Uh, what is the future? And I think this academic world, we have a lot of opportunities. And we lost that a little bit because we are all so busy with producing papers, with writing grants, with doing administrations, with all these things. Please give us a little bit more space for that. I would think the academy, academy would benefit from it and our students would benefit from it. Well, that's exactly what we're here for, actually, because we would like to discuss your molecular car, yeah. your molecular motor with you. And we were thinking and we wondered, was there a kind of eureka moment at some point in research where you kind of like got it or? Yeah, now we, when we started, and I mentioned this at my lecture earlier, when we started in, uh, in the late 80s, I had to build my own group. You think about what kind of research projects, and there was this money available for smart materials in this country. And the idea was, what we put forward, can we do information storage at the molecular level? So that's why we built molecular switches. Like you have switches in your eye, you have switches in your computer, eh? in the transistors, in your smartphone. We thought, can we build molecules where we can store information and we can switch? between two states. Maybe I have a picture of them. Let me see, do I have a picture? Yeah, yeah, this is the picture of the eye, the switch in your eye. And we thought, can we use this principle? Build molecules. But you cannot use these molecules from the eye because they are way too sensitive. Eh? They only work properly in the biological context in your eye. But they switch between two states. It's a digital information system. Like in your laptop, like in your computer. But now it's in the system. And we thought, what kind of molecules can we design to switch back and forth, back and forth? And that was when we did that, that was the first Eureka moment. <coughs> then, nine years later, my students were working on the switches, and they switch, instead of switching forward and backward, forward, backward, it was not switching backward. And we thought, that cannot be. I said to my students, this, is, this, is, this cannot be. It should switch backward. This is what we have seen now during nine years. And the molecules were not so different, a little bit different. But suddenly, when we, it took us three weeks to figure out, and this was the real Eureka moment, 
Then we discovered that it was not switching back, but it was switching forward. So imagine, you go 90 degrees, you go again 90 degrees, that's 180 degrees. And then you think, oh, 180 degrees, that's half a circle. Can we do it twice? And you have a 360 degree cycle. But then, the question came, how to go right or left? But now I give yeah, so uh, you shared your price with uh, Sir Peter Stoller and yeah. Peter Shabash. But if I look at their molecules, they don't look really similar to <coughs> your molecules. So no. in what way are they uh, different and in what they, way are they similar? Yeah. Now what they do is they make molecules, like rings, yeah, and they move on a... On a you, you can imagine, you have a bar or a string, and you make a ring move from left to right, left to right. Or you make two rings and they move to, with respect to each other. Right? Now, that is the kind of designs they make. So different components that move to, with respect to each other. What we made is the first light-driven rotary motor. So actually, we, we realized, after, when we discovered it, nobody ever made something that rotates around an axle, yeah, like a real motor. Rotating, rotating, rotating. And of course you have to put in energy, and the energy comes from the light, the fuel, light. Light energy, it's a light driven motor. It's very clean. Huh? So did you cooperate in any way with them? Yeah, we, we have we cooperated uh, once with Fraser Stoddard on the molecular piston, but we never had some real cooperation because they have different approach. They work on these molecules that move linearly, eh? like on, the, as I said, a ring that shifts, eh? moves over a string while we were making real things that rotate right around the axle, like a, a rotary motor. I saw them, of course, many, many times at conferences. We were at joint conferences all the time. But they took a completely different approach, so from different angles. And this you see often in science. Eh? People have different ways to approach a, a certain problem. So we actually want to know more about your motor. Yeah. Um, and a very important part of it is virality. Yeah. And in our commission, it wasn't even clear for all of us. So we'd like to ask if you could explain. Yeah. To shall all of shall us. I look a few slides then? So when you, okay, let, let me go to this motor. This is the motor that I showed before. This is the motor that you want, the ATPS motor. It's a rotary motor. It's a few nanometers in size. What you see here, it rotates. We all agree with that. Eh? and it produces the fuel in your body. I said before, half your body weight every 24 hours, every day. And it rotates, but it also rotates in one direction. Because if you make a rotary motor, and it rotates clockwise or counterclockwise, forward or backward, with equal probability, you won't get anywhere, you stand still. Your car doesn't move, nothing moves. You should either go clockwise or counterclockwise. And the way we solve this is by virality. And uh, Jan here teach you, I think, and Hank, that when you have a left hand or a right hand, there's the molecule. Jan, can you show that molecule? Left or right? Mirror images. That's crucial, eh? Left-handed molecule or a right-handed molecule? Your amino acids. Yes, the amino acids. In your body, it's left-handed. One mirror image it's one. The DNA that you see here is right-handed. Left and right. Yeah. Two mirror images. Two mirror images, left and right. Breaking the symmetry is crucial for our cars, is crucial for the molecules in your life. You would not live without left-handed amino acids, left-handed proteins, right-handed DNA. This is a fundamental question of life and nobody knows how and why. This is one of the most important questions of science. Ask Robert Dijkstra, where are we from? How did life come to earth? And one of the most fundamental, fundamental questions is, how did left distinguish from right? Why are amino acids left? Why is DNA right? This is the fundamental basic question, maybe the most important question in science. I mean, it's nice to know what black holes are, but I would say it's nicer to know where life comes from. What happened before the Darwinian evolution? So this is left and right, and thanks to Amsterdam, 
You guys be happy. There's a statue here of Van Hoff. Van Hoff is the hero. Because Van Hoff told us there's a difference between left and right, and molecules have a three dimensional structure. The tetrahedral model. So we built the motors either left handed or right handed. The right handed part goes clockwise, forward, the left handed part goes counterclockwise. This is how we did it. So, um, how do you combine a variety uh, and control it to, to make uh, uh, the motor control only forward, not go back? Yeah. So here is a uh, here is the motor, yeah, and it rotates, as you can see, it rotates only when we put in energy, the fuel, that's light. You have to put on your lamp. Eh? When you switch off the lamp, it stops, and it goes through four steps. Look at the different colors. You see, it rotates. And it gets four colors, eh? There are the four steps. Here are them. Four steps. And now I have to look at these molecules. You see, when you start in the left upper corner, you see a small CH3 group, a carbon with three hydrogens, and it's standing more or less up. Look here. You see this one here? It's oriented like this, eh? Like my hand. Okay? And now we got the energy of the light, you change the molecule, and this small group is now more lying flat. It's not like this, like this. This makes the difference that pushes it in a certain direction. This molecule is only right-handed, and this small group here makes it that it moves in this direction. This pushes it forward yeah, in a right-handed cycle. We can make the mirror image, the left hand. And when you hit it with light, it goes in the opposite direction. So we can move it forward and backward. Clockwise and counter. So that was the trick. So where did you get this idea for the basic structure for this molecule? <coughs> now the basic structure, as I said before, we started many years ago with this idea, like in your eye, can you change the shape of a molecule with light? Can you make 010101, the digital system? That's how we did it. Yeah, well, I, I don't see the, the, the structure of retinol uh, back in, in this yeah. motor of yours. Yeah, but now we go to the chemistry. You all learn in your first year chemistry, I think every student, even in high school, learns it. When you have a carbon-carbon single bond, that is free rotation. Look at this guy. Here. Carbon, carbon, single bond, there's free rotation, but of course there's no preference, clockwise or counterclockwise, and it rotates extremely far. But now you make a double bond, like in our motors, like the retinol in your arm. There's no free rotation. Double bond, eh? two bonds, no free rotation. But when, with light energy, you break one of the bonds, there's no two, double, two bonds anymore, there's one bond. This process is extremely fast in your eyes, picoseconds, also in our system. So we thought, if we take the same principle, you make a carbon-carbon double bond, you have two eh, different forms, you can break the double bond, you can rotate around the double bond, then maybe we can build such a system, like in your eye. Once again, you cannot take the molecules from your eye, eh? when you take them out there, they get easily destroyed. You have to build synthetic ones that are more Robust. You don't break, take your brain cell to build your computer or so your smartphone. Yeah, that doesn't work. We learn a lot now, and I would like also to invite the audience yeah. to ask questions. So you can uh, raise your hand. We have two um, from our uh, commission that walk around, so you can ask questions. But first, um, is there anybody who wants to ask a question? Please. Yes, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, I'll go first. Um, so, you talked about how the university needs to be a playground for the mind, I guess. But could you maybe specify a little bit more how you see that in practice uh, happening within university? Because I think the mentality already is that you are, you, you are kind of free to do your research when you want and uh, how you want it, to do it. Uh, so, yeah, maybe specify. Yeah, let, let me make absolutely clear. Universities are not separated from society. Eh? Universities are part of society. 
and we look at the world around us and we all see challenges, we see important questions and whatever. If I look at humanities, uh, social sciences, you look for instance at problems associated with integration of people in society. These are important questions. Also some very fundamental questions. When you look at chemistries, for instance, one of the fundamental questions is, how can we make a fuel from CO2? Just to give you another example. How are we going to fly in our planes in the future? It costs me more money to come with an electric train from Groningen to Schiphol, and lately I discovered that it was more expensive than flying on kerosene to Spain. This is worrying. And I'm not going to fly on electricity soon, not on solar panels or whatever. So we have a serious problem. So how can we make CO2 and make a fuel? So we are not disconnected from society. But we should also look forward and think about fundamental scientific question. Being it in the natural sciences, I showed you an example, being in humanities, or thinking about law, philosophy, whatever. There are so many questions. Look beyond our horizon. And if we look at our future, and we, our task is to train you, young guys, yeah, for our future, we, we have definitely have to look forward. And, and you have to challenge us and say, look, is this important what we learn? To bring us forward? And that needs also to give us space for that. So we cannot only, of course we should connect with daily problems, but we should also look forward and ahead, and not only think about uh, problems of today, because these problems might be obsolete in five years or ten years from now. Okay, I see we have another question from the audience. <laughs> well, I actually had exactly the same question, so oh, thank good. you. <laughs> okay, thank you. I see another uh, question. Applications of your work and also in comparison to the other people with whom you share the yeah. Nobel Prize. So I think I will interrupt because this will get later on in our uh, questions. So you will learn about it later. Oh yeah, the future practical case. Okay. But we will discuss it later. Yes. Yeah, sure. All right. Any questions about uh, working mechanisms? Then we'll continue because I have a question actually. Um, so, uh, the first time you made this molecule in 1999, it only rotated around yeah. a couple of times per second, and uh, now it's uh, uh, picoseconds per one rotation. How did you speed that up uh, so yeah. extremely? Yeah, what you can do is the following. You see here uh, this motor. Now, I mentioned already the process in your eye yeah, is extremely fast, picoseconds. It's so fast, it's very difficult to meet. You need all this very fancy spectroscopy equipment to measure. The, the, there are four steps here. Eh? I showed you this cycle, four steps. There's a photochemical step and thermal step. The thermal, the step under the influence of heat, the environment, is the slow step. And so originally it was once an hour. And what we did is we simply modified the molecule, and I can do to illustrate. You take this, and it has to flip along each other. And if you make this a little bit wider, yeah, it flips faster. And this is how we did it. <laughs> so you build the molecule, you build the molecule a little bit different, widen the gap a little bit, and it goes faster. Yeah. So are there other like ups and downs you you had during this process? Oh. Because we all know about ups and downs in science. Ups and downs. Let me make, uh, for all those people that are involved in science or are ambitious to become a scientist, if you are not enthusiastic or are not daring to go into unknown territory, don't become a scientist. But if you are not, cannot stand some frustration sometimes, also become not a scientist. Because we all know sometimes there is a lot of failure. But the beauty is that we learn a lot from your failure. So, don't tell your professors that it's not a problem to fail an exam sometimes. Because you learn a lot from that. Or to fail an experiment. Yeah? Because you learn a lot from that. We have a lot of failures. Could you and sometimes... Sorry? Do we have an example? Of yeah. Like, for instance, we made these windmills I discussed before. We put these motors on the surface, they spin. So we made a nano windmill. One billionth of a meter in size. So we thought, okay, we will build a windmill. 
I will demonstrate. What is a windmill? It stands yeah, like you know the windmill, and then you have a propeller and it rotates. Eh? Like this, or like this. So originally we thought, okay, we pay the windmill, we make a rotor, like a motor. Yeah? Of course, it's not the wind, it's the sun, eh? the light eh? that rotates it. We need two legs. Yeah? Why two legs? Because if you have only one leg, yeah? you saw it start to rotate and it will rotate like we know. But when you have two legs, it will move and it will rotate and it's there. But then, what we did is, we made a beautiful design. It took us one year. And then we completely failed. It did not rotate. And we thought, how is that possible? We put it on gold. And we had the legs very, very, very tiny. So very small leg. So here was the rotor and here was the gold. So we put the energy from the light in the motor to make it rotating, but the energy directly went to the gold. The gold, gold you know that, metals absorb energy very easily. So it didn't rotate. So then we had to redesign, my students work hard, we had to build long legs. And then the rotor is high up, it does not interfere with the surface, and it rotates nicely. And now we have a nano windmill park <laughs> designed from scratch. Okay, so we have this rotor now, but how do we go from a rotor like a windmill to a nano car which drives straight? Yeah, that is another really interesting question. So here's the nano car. This is the molecule, let me see, do I have This is the molecule. This is the nano car. This is the chemical structure. <laughs> I had this structure in my in, in my own. But this is the molecule we had to build, which was not easy. And you see here from this cartoon, you have four wheels. These four wheels are motors. So we built a four-wheel drive. So we built a chassis here, yeah, this part, and then we built four wheels. And these four wheels are rotating motors. And uh, that, that the idea was, that the fundamental, it was not about building an animal car, that's nice, I mean, uh, it's nice, it's a nice picture of a movie. Of course, the fundamental question, and this is what scientists should think about, eh? what are the scientific questions? This is what your teachers confront you all the time with, eh? not about the answer, but about the question. That's the most important. So the fundamental question was here, how can we make something that rotates Make a linear movement, like your car. Eh? A rotating motor and it moves linear on the road. But then we had a problem. Because when you build a car, think about, I mentioned this before, some of you know the answer. Look at these cars on the street. If you have a car moving forward, you look at the car, the wheels, yeah, both four wheels go in the same direction, eh? Otherwise the move will yeah, if the, move, the, the car moves backward, also the wheels move in the same direction, counterclockwise, clockwise, or counterclockwise. But now you are a driver. Sit in your car behind the steering wheel. Did you ever thought about it? <laughs> this is a very fundamental stereochemical problem. Yeah? And then you remember the lessons of Jan van Maasafein about stereochemistry, left and right. Never forget. Also for the biologists and the physics people here, eh? never forget. When you drive in your car, one of the wheels yeah, goes clockwise and the other wheel goes counterclockwise. You ever thought about that? Because if both wheels go in the same direction, you know what the car does? This. And this is actually what we found. Because originally we thought, oh, we built them nicely that they move all clockwise and the car never moved in a linear way. So then we built the way, the, the wheels like this. Yeah? One moves in one direction and the other moves in another direction. So one moves like this and the other moves like this. This is a symmetry problem. Fundamental symmetry problem. And then the car moved nicely. Yeah, a bit. I mean, it was not a, a primitive car. Eh? It moved a bit like this. But it moved rel relatively straight towards on the nano scale, right? So, is there another question from the audience? Yes, there is. Uh, thank you. I, I was curious if you have a reverse gear in your car. So, can you... Oh, 
can you invert the chirality of one of these four systems to make it in situ go backward or forward? This is a fantastic question. Because I go to, to elementary school kids, yeah? and they, uh, they ask me always the question, but uh, professor, this nano car, it has no steering wheel. How do you get around the corner? But the, the, pro the problem that you address, yeah? yeah? Can you repeat the question once again? Because I think this is such an important question. So the question was, you have four chiral centers. If yes. you reverse the direction of one of the chiral centers, you can Understand, turn Understand, huh? please. Of course, we can go clockwise and counterclockwise, left and right. I just mentioned what we do. We take one molecule that goes in this direction. We take a molecule that goes in that direction. So indeed, this is a very fundamental and important question. Because this gentleman asked me, how do you go backward? Yeah, we can take the opposite, the mirror image. But you don't do that in your car, eh? when you want to park, you don't put in another motor. Take out the motor, put in another motor that goes backward. No, you switch in the back gear. And indeed, this is exactly what we did. What we did is, we took the stereochemistry. I talked about this small metal substituent. You remember the group? The group that was standing up or lying down. And by a special trick, we do an inversion of the stereochemistry. So from up to down. During the rotary cycle, we can switch it. And then instead of going forward, it goes backward. That was the stereochemical track. It's stereochemical inversion. And if you want to hear the details once again, follow the lecture of Young, he can explain it in detail. Stereochemical inversion is a really important <coughs> chemical principle. That was how we did it. Yes, we can stop, change the stereochemistry, and then we move backward. Because you still need the light. Because without fuel, no move. So, what we were wondering about is uh, whether you were uh, the only one in this field uh, studying molecular motors, or did you have competitors? And, uh, <coughs> were they as close as you were to uh, no, molecular motors? That's also a good point. There were all the groups that were studying molecular motors, I think. There was a group in, uh, in Yale, but he never made a real motor. And then there were some people working on chemical because But in fact, the thing that came closest was indeed this pioneering work by Stoddard and Zobar with their rings, you know? Because what they did is they make a large ring and a smaller ring that was moving around like this. And that also, that looks like a molecular motor, yeah? So they were, uh, uh, there were no other ones at that time. Now there are many groups. They didn't have to worry about other groups stealing yeah, you your publications. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's also a good point. I mean, when you work in science and you are in a competitive field, we all want to have this Eureka moment. We want to be the first to do any kind of discovery. And of course, the field was competitive. And when people realize that you can make these kind of things, many people try to do that, and maybe even make better ones and other designs and so on. So competition is also something, and particularly in natural sciences, is, uh, yeah, it's strong, we know that. We compete with groups in Japan and in America and England and Germany, but this is, this is natural in the natural side. So we actually had already a little bit of discussion about it, but we were wondering, because you said a few times it's been pretty fundamental, what you've done, yeah. um, but is there also an application, or can you...? Yeah, that's, uh, that's another very important point. Of course, this is very fundamental research, and uh, uh, of course, I mentioned before that we have also strong connection with industry and so not per se with this research, but we do a lot, lot of work on catalysis and on uh, sort kind of materials. In particular, in catalysis, we have some collection of industry. And one of our processes has been uh, used in industry to make a, an important work. Um, our catalysts are now used in many laboratories and industries around the world. Here, this is a bit more fundamental, more long term, but realize once you are able to make dynamic functions, to make something that is not only static, but something that can move, like in your body and so on. It gives a lot of new opportunities. So we already, as I discussed during my lecture earlier, we make smart drugs. So pharmaceuticals, drugs, that can change from an inactive to an active state. So to make smart therapies. We also look now at materials where we can change surfaces. And you can think about smart windmills, 
you have glass that changes surfaces. So glass here that you don't have to clean, but that cleans itself. Raindrops that go off because you change yeah, the attachment of glass or dust. Think about solar panels. I mentioned this before. Solar panels or your car, it gets dusty, you have to clean it. But if you have smart material, it cleans itself. If you have one final example, which is really hard, self-repairing materials. If you have a scratch in my face, where's, where's, here, I have a scratch here in my tub. I don't have to do anything. Now, I have a cold now, so it might take another few days because but, uh, normally when you are healthy, it repairs itself. Okay? Yeah, but the thing is, when you like just won your Nobel Prize, even in the news, some people said, we can now, we have this car, we can have drugs in the car. Yeah, yeah. We can bring the drug exactly to the place where it needed to yeah. be. And yeah. is it is yeah. an application that is yeah. even... Let me finish first then this self-repair material. Uh, self in the future, not so far from now, 10 years from now, when you buy an expensive car, you have a scratch in your car, it will repair itself. Because these tiny eh, balls, they will pop open, and oxygen or light comes through the ball, it opens, you know, with a switch, material flows out and repairs itself. The nano car, yeah, people ask, can you, repair, can you deliver a drug or do a repair in your body, eh? you inject this tiny thing. Not our cars, of course. I mean, this is just to prove a principle. But once you are able to move autonomously, you can put all kinds of gadgets, build tiny robots. I predict that in 50 years from now, not tomorrow, but 50 years from now, yes, our surgeons will be these tiny robots, and the doctor will inject yeah, a tiny robot in your blood vein, and it will go to do a repair or deliver a drug exactly on the spot. That is what happens already with the proteins in our body. And why not doing it in an artificial manner? Of course, now we get to an interesting discussion. Do we want that? How fast will we move with technology? Ethical aspects, all these things. But yes, it will happen, I'm convinced. Um, so, I have a hard time imagining uh, in 15 years uh, uh, surgeons uh, uh, being uh, uh, put into our bodies um, and, and the reason is uh, that we, our bodies are so incredibly complex we can't even begin to make a bacteria, we can't even begin to make mitochondria. Um, how do we hope to, uh, to make so, uh, a molecule that, that we can control exactly how we want it? In, in our ah, this, this is really fascinating. If you realize that everybody here has a smartphone, these display materials were uh, invented by chemists and the, the transistors by physics in the end of the 40s and 50s. Yeah? More than half a century. It took, it took 50 years yeah? to develop a smartphone. Nobody knew, of course, in the 50s, the term smartphone or computer or this kind of thing. Nobody had any idea. The word didn't exist. We had no idea that it would come in 50 years. <coughs> The first smartphone, as far as I know, the iPhone, was introduced 11 years ago. It completely changed our society. We didn't know these materials when it's, when it's used for that. Uh, yeah, we, we don't know yet. We have to adapt. We will not. But to think of your body, people find it normal that you, when your knee, you, have, you are getting a little bit older, that you get an artificial knee or a hip. How many people get hip implants? How many people get stems or... Uh, yeah, artificial parts in the body for your heart, whatever. We find it normal. In the future, of course, we will get these micro jet gadgets. You get a chip implanted that helps you with certain function. If we can interface something to our neural network, to our brain, it might help us with, with walking. And if you are disabled, you might, or you, you cannot see. There are now the first examples that they make blind mice pick up some vision again by implanting, yeah? some circuitry, yeah? even some molecular design, the trauma together with some colleagues, yeah? like the switchable drugs, they make switchable neurotransmitters. So they can switch on some, some neural function. Why not? Yeah, then you can discuss how far do we want to go to re-engineer your body? Are we becoming half robots in the future? But once again, 
if you get an hip implant, everybody says, oh, that's fine, because my father, or my mother, or my uncle can walk again. Yeah? Or when I'm old, I, I, I will have it. Why not a small chip to help you? When you get a little bit, you, you forget things, you know, I forget your name. It helps me to remember. Why not? But of course, there are also ethical points. Do you exactly. want to have a chip? Because your child is maybe less smart, do you want to increase, yeah? The That's brain function a, a bit? Very I don't know, but I think this is the discussion we should have at the university. I think there is a question from the audience. Or so. Here comes the ethic. Oh. Yeah. My background is medicine and ethics and neuroscience. So with the rise of uh, artificial intelligence uh, rapidly, actually, we got it wrong by three years, and uh, also the simplification of blockchain building, and then you have this smart material. My question is when they will meet. Yeah. But my first question was, if you correct me, you said on your experiment of the zero one, they went 90 degrees and then 128 degrees. Do you see that evolution? Yeah, we can see that, of course. We can follow it precisely in time when we go from this step to this step to this step to this step to make a circle. We can follow each step. But do you see it as evolution? No, no, no. That's, no, I know what you mean. That the system evolves. Self-learning. Yeah, no, no. The evolution is in the laboratory that we make better designs, faster ones, new molecules, etc. Evolutionary chemistry that systems adapt by themselves. This is another hot topic. We have in this country now, we established in the context of the Dutch science agenda. You know the National Elevate yeah. Science Agenda? Yeah. This is this origins initiative where people from astrophysics to uh, neurobiologists to uh, ecologists, chemists, physics, etc. People work together on, for instance, replicative systems, adaptive systems, artificial evolutionary systems, etc. We put in some things about motion and motors and all these things. Uh, this is really fascinating. And this is very early uh, stage, very long-term research. How things can adapt, how things can change their behavior, how things pick up signals from the outside and then adapt, like a human being does, like Mother Nature does in evolution. We have no idea. Will you introduce a kill switch? Uh, a kill switch. Switch. A okay. kill switch. Huh? Kill switch. A kill switch. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not allowed to say this, but recently we made, for instance, a switch where we have a, 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 a compound that uh, is involved in the heart rhythm. And we can take heart cells and we can make them beating harder and slower. So we can also stop that. Is there not much needed to do that because you can take a drug and you can kill. I don't want to get involved. <laughs> I saw another question from the audience. So I had a question about the structure because in the chassis you see one single carbon carbon bond. Yeah. So how does this rotating influence your? Oh yeah, yeah. That's a very good point. Very small. Let me say this: the original design, we had a single single bond here. And of course, this can take different orientations. So here, what we, uh, we put this molecule that landed on the surface, and sometimes it landed in the wrong direction because it was rotating. And then it didn't move properly. Yes, you're absolutely right. So now we make half of this, like a dragster, and then we put more rigid system. That works for me. So then we are continuing. We found a quote, which I will read, and we'd like to have your reaction to it. Um, some chemists argue that although these motors are cute, they are utterly useless by themselves because they are too difficult to make, skill up and control. And we were well wondering what you think about it because you say we have proven a uh, principle, proven principle, we show that we can do it, but do you agree with this or do you say this is like... Insult. Uh, an insult, yeah. Uh, no, I, I'm not easily uh, insulted. Because if, uh, once again, if you are a scientist or a scholar and you cannot stand criticism, uh, please find another job. Uh, we, we live with criticism because you have to prove people wrong or you have to prove things are right. So, with respect to what we do, yes, of course, these are complex systems. Uh, some of them are absolutely useless, except 
for proven principles, as I mentioned. This nanocarverse proves the fundamental principle. How to go from rotary motion to translational motion, eh? moving forward at the nanoscale. Of course, it is not useful at this stage. We make all kinds of molecules that might not be useful at this stage, but maybe do the groundwork for smart materials in the future, new drugs, new processes in industry. I mentioned smart windows, self healing materials. People in France use our motors to make pieces of plastic. When you switch on the lamp, you can change, contract, and expand. They change shape. So you can make a glass that can change shape. I don't know why we want it, but if you want to have a half valve that can change shape, it could be extremely useful. So there are all kinds of possibilities for future application. And of course, industry will ask, can you make it more easy? Can you make it cheaper? Can you make the design more co less complicated? But yes, that is what we will learn. Do you think it's your job to think about the ex uh, applications or do you yeah. feel like you only need to no. think or... Um... No, we think a lot about potential applications. Like I mentioned, and I let me took this example once again of the drugs, we work together with people in, we work with surgeons, with cancer surgeons that are in the hospital handling patients. And we work together with them to make better methods so that, for instance, they can see small tumors and they can address small tumors to kill them, for instance, with a light signal. That's a bit of a dream. It might take 10 years, it might take 15 years, but we will get there. This is the kind of applications completely different from what we do now look at those kind of possibilities, yes? And uh, I'm really excited about those, those kind of, of possibilities, yes. So I have one final question for you. Uh, so if there was one big research question you could still answer in the remainder of your career, what would it be? Yeah, that uh, question I got a few times by journalists as well. Uh, what would you really still like to discover? Of course, we have an ongoing program with motors and switches and things I talked about today. But if you ask me the real fundamental question that I would love to have a glimpse of an answer, and I, I realize it will be impossible because people have been thinking about it, is that question that I was just discussing. What is the origin of homo garality, left or right? Why is it that all our amino acids in our body are left-handed? Why is it that DNA is right-handed? This is one of the most fundamental questions directly at the basis of the origin of life. Where are we from? We are all happy with the Darwinian evolution. But what was yeah, this billion of years before Darwin? Because once you have life, once you have one cellular organisms, then how did that material come to life? How was it that this selection was made for left and right, which is so crucial to build life at the molecular scale? That is one of my dreams, and the other dream, if I'm allowed, yeah, is that I have a few more years to make young people enthusiastic for science, because I would like to, I don't know if this time is up, but to finish with this. This is the most important one for all of you. Not for the senior ones, yeah, but the junior ones. Not everybody will get the Nobel Prize. I was so lucky, you know, to get this amazing yeah, call from Stockholm. Uh, it's a dream for a young scientist, right? for all of us. But you need to uh, work hard, persevere, and you may have to need a lot of luck as well to make this coffee. But most important for all of you, discover your talent. Follow your dreams, like I did. Be confident. Everybody here has a talent. One will become a chemist, other a teacher, somebody go to industry or society. Maybe you become an artist. But discover your energy. What will give you, what is your passion? And what will give you a lot of energy? And how high can you put the bar? If Jan here gives a different exam, difficult exercise, don't always think, oh my god. I, when I was a student, I sometimes thought, oh god, this professor, this is terrible. 
But when you solve it, it gives such a fantastic game. Sometimes it's great to put the bar a little bit higher and see how high you can jump. But most important, follow your dreams. This is my most important message to you. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. I think you should all take this in mind and maybe join our committee because we're looking for new members, especially famous <laughs> people. Uh, we would very like to thank you for being here and it's such an honor to us and to all our committee. And um, our next gallery is the 16th of May, so please be there. And again, thanks very much for being Pleasure. here.